Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things that you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And today we are talking about the uh, science of snow prediction with Dan DePoblet, AccuWeather's Senior Director of Forecast Operations. And Dan, um, this is a, a big part of our operation here in our business at AccuWeather, snowfall forecasting. Uh, and uh, Dan, this is such an important thing to talk about uh, as, well, it's impactful to so many people. It sure is good to be with you, Jeff. And I think snow is, it's, well, for me, it's one of the most interesting uh, things to forecast. It's, it's really what inspired me to uh, be a meteorologist back when I was a kid growing up in New Jersey. We'll talk a bit about that later on, I think. And snow is really impactful to people. It shuts down schools. It, it uh, snarls supply chains with uh, packages getting delivered later and can really uh, be dangerous too, obviously, from a traffic perspective. So it really impacts a lot of people throughout the winter season across the United States. And for the most part, with snow, the report card is very visible. People know how much snow fell in their backyard most of the time. Sometimes it's melting, but compared to rain, uh, snow uh, is uh, something that you know, people know when we're accurate or when the forecast doesn't work out as well. So we want to talk about what goes into the AccuWeather forecast with snowfall. Uh, how complicated is our process? Yeah, so it's, it's certainly uh, one of the more challenging things that we forecast as a team. And at, at AccuWeather, we've developed a philosophy over many decades about how we approach all types of forecasting, but especially snow. One of the things that's important to us is uh, being consistent with our forecast and not flip-flopping around with different forecasts uh, as a storm approaches. So trying to set ourselves up with a forecast initially that is uh, sort of what we expect is the best forecast three, four days in advance that limits the potential for changes as, as we approach that storm from an accumulation perspective, as well as the timing of the snow that's obviously very important and how fast the snow falls is very important for road crews in terms of how they can keep up with the snow uh, during the storm. And there's been a lot of change in weather data and modeling and so forth compared to 40 or 50 years ago when there were maybe two options. Uh, so how many different models do we have at our disposal here at AccuWeather uh, that we might consult when putting together a snowfall forecast? So we're looking at a variety of different models, both publicly available ones that the different governments across the world run, like the National Weather Service in the United States. We also have access to proprietary data sets, and we're looking at different cutting edge tools like some of the new artificial intelligence uh, models that are coming out sort of uh, very rapidly from many different organizations. So we have about 170 or now even more maybe d different models that we look at and we combine them in different ways to uh, see how the data uh, looks and we have different tools to look at those and our meteorologists use those to help refine the forecast even further. And we're really proud of our team's success and the AccuWeather forecast is created differently than a lot of others out there. Uh, I, uh, when I worked in local TV, you know, I admit I was not aware of how much went into the AccuWeather forecast especially when it comes to uh, the human aspect of things, because there are computer model uh, driven apps out there where there's no human that ever really touches that forecast. That's very different at AccuWeather. Yeah, we're really proud of the team that we have of our meteorologists. We have uh, close to 100 expert meteorologists across AccuWeather, and many of them work on our snow forecasts and ice forecasts during the winter months. And it's really a consensus approach. That's an important part of the AccuWeather philosophy. That's not just my forecast or your forecast, Jeff. It's, it's the entire team providing their input together and people's different experiences and knowledge bases to help come up with a forecast that's better than any one individual can do uh, uh, by themselves and it's that human input into the forecast on top of the really uh, cutting edge data that really sets AccuWeather's forecasts apart that we provide not just a forecast of how much snow or when it'll fall uh, but also uh, the the impacts of that snow or that ice when it will happen will it happen during the commute uh, will it fall overnight will it melt on the road because it's been pretty warm ahead of the storm so we try to really convey the impacts of the storm as well as the context of it and that's the important piece that our meteorologists add on top of the data and every storm is a learning experience I know that you're a better forecaster now than you were five six seven years ago I am more dialed in now uh, just with weather than, than I was when I first graduated from college. And a lot of our forecasters have been doing this for decades. Uh, and they have a good knack for not just meteorology, but also the geography. So how important is geography and climatology uh, in influencing that forecast, these subtle differences in wind direction for the Great Lakes and so forth? 
Yeah, I think both of those are key. Uh, to be a good meteorologist, understanding geography and what has happened in the past, so climatology are both very important. You have to know, so a, a wind in a certain direction, does that cause cooling or warming? Is it coming off a warm body of water, like is often the case early in the season in the Northeast, where that Atlantic Ocean temperature is, is warmer than it is later in the season? That can cause more rain than snow, sometimes in December in parts of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. And what has happened in the past is very important. So has this, are, are you predicting something that has never occurred in recorded history? That's something you know where What's the frequency of this type of snow event in a certain area? And also knowing that a snowstorm of one inch in Atlanta is very different impact wise than a one inch snowstorm in Buffalo, New York. Absolutely. Is there one part of the country or maybe one type of snow regime, whether it might be an Arctic front with snow squalls or lake effect snow, that you uh, especially enjoy forecasting? I think. Probably based on, on where I grew up in New Jersey, uh, the, these deep coastal lows, nor'easters in the winter that bring a variety of hazards. Sometimes, sometimes they can be all rain, but in the winter they tend to be a, a mix of rain and snow. You're trying to find where that rain snow line will be and when the change will, changeover will happen. And in some places you can get one to two feet of snow in pretty high population zones. And I think those to me are the ones that are most interesting. I grew up in the northwestern suburbs of Philadelphia and um it's not fun to watch that rain snow line nudge across the city coming into the northwestern suburbs when uh, you know you want to hold on to the snow especially if you're a kid hoping to get out of school the next day uh, and forecasting snow is so different in other parts of the country when i worked in the midwest uh, it was a little bit unnerving to forecast snow when the storm didn't exist on radar yet it would develop over the plains on the lee side of the Rockies. so there's a lot that goes into this in different parts of the country so is there a difference in predicting snowfall maybe in november december as opposed to the middle of winter or into the early spring. Yeah, so depending on the time of year, it's definitely important to look at a variety of factors. Early in the season, sometimes we, uh, well, first of all, a lot of people may not have been used to snow yet because it hasn't happened in six, eight months. So just people aren't as prepared for winter weather and driving in that. Uh, so the, conveying the impacts there is, is very important. Also, sometimes there's not as much treatment on the roads, salt and other types of treatment on the roads. And sometimes that means that the roads can be more slick early on in the season. Uh, temperatures, especially later in the season, you have to watch for the sun angle. The higher the sun angle, by uh, late February and March during if snow falls during the day in March for instance it has a harder time accumulating on the roads because the sun angle is higher so it helps to melt the uh, snow as it falls if it's not falling at a very good uh, rate so there's a variety of different factors throughout the season that we look at in addition to just what the forecast of uh, sort of like how much liquid is coming uh, from that storm to determine how much snow will fall and I know that uh, when I worked in local TV um, I worked at one station in Northwest Pennsylvania where uh, a lot of the time in that market, people would typically run these model-driven forecasts, and they would predict snowfall down to you know 8.3 inches or something like that. It was a model-driven thing, and that would kind of broad brush things, uh, but it was almost communicating too much certainty, too much precision. We tend to forecast in ranges, and ultimately that's what I, I prefer doing when I work there as well. Uh, so why do we predict in ranges as opposed to precise amounts of snow? So one reason is the... Uh is the fact that between a couple of inches, there's usually not a big difference in impact. Three to six inches, pretty similar impact. It's a plowable snow. It's going to cause disruption to roads. Six to 12 inches, you're talking a more significant snowstorm. And one or two inches, pretty you know, similar types of impacts and similar types of response are um, are needed in those types of events. Also, there's a lot of uh, just small changes in the amount of liquid that comes from a storm have, have larger impacts on how much snow falls. Uh, we'll talk a bit about snow ratio coming up, and that's something that we can dive into more. So it's, 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 it's a bit more difficult than, than rain to actually predict the amount, and that's one of the reasons that ranges are very helpful for people to see what the uh, impact will be. As we're honest, too, we try to be honest. You know, we want to give you a confident forecast, if we just waffle with our uncertainty, that's not going to help anybody. But at the same time, there's a little more honesty in uh, a, a forecast range. And, and that AccuWeather Wintercast is a fantastic feature because that's a very transparent look at our confidence level in any of those ranges. Yeah, and with Wintercast, is one of the really unique features of the AccuWeather app. And on our website, you can see not just the forecast of how much snow we expect, for instance, three to six inches, but what's the probability of it of, of more snow than that, six to ten, or what's the probability of less snow than that, one to three inches, for example, to give you a sense for what our confidence is in that forecast. Okay. Well, we have our first viewer question. This one comes to us from Paul in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, how is snowfall measured? I've measured snow in my backyard before and have nearly a foot of snow that I see on the news. It was only officially about eight inches. So why are the amounts so different? 
So it really depends how you measure. And there is a best practice to measuring that the National Weather Service has set. And it's really uh, the way you want to do it is have a snow board. So a, a flat, it could just be a wooden board that you put out well before the snow starts to fall. So it's at the actual air temperature. And then you measure on that board with a ruler. Um, and you don't brush it off every hour either because that can inflate amounts too. Uh, but but measuring on the grass can sometimes cause an inflated amount because if you push that ruler too far down and it goes into the grass underneath the snow, you can get more snow than, is, than has fallen. Also, drifting is pretty common in open spaces. So you can, um, if you are going to measure in an open field, take a number of measurements and average those measurements to get the best representation of what has fallen. Okay, all very good advice there. And, and um, even beyond that, sometimes what happens at the airport is going to be different than six, seven, eight miles away. And those of you in Lake Effect snow area certainly know the variety there. Uh, so a lot of good stuff so far, Dan, different ways to answer these questions and uh, a lot to think about with snow. Uh, again, Dan, our Senior Director of Forecast Operations, he's got a big job here at AccuWeather. And coming up, we're going to be putting your knowledge to the test in our WeatherWise segment, Is This Really a Thing? Like, can you really get sick if you go outside with wet hair? We'll look at that. But next, we're going to explain what snow ratios are and why they are so important when a storm is coming. We'll answer more of your viewer questions as well when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and today we are talking about the science of snow prediction at AccuWeather's Senior Director of Forecast Operations and AccuWeather snow expert. He's here for a specific reason. Uh, Dan DePodwin is back. And Dan, we're talking all about snow and how AccuWeather forecasts snow. And, you know, there's a lot to this. People uh, sometimes may not realize how intentional we are in trying to bring the, the greatest snowfall forecast that we can and the, uh, the winter cast product that you talked about, AccuWeather.com and the AccuWeather app, you can look for that snowflake icon whenever you're dealing with snow in your forecast. But Dan, uh, one of the big things that does either inflate or deflate a storm's potential for snowfall is snow ratio. So what is a snow ratio and, and how do we calculate this and, and look at this? So snow ratio, if we think about it, when you're forecasting just rain, uh, all these models that we look at as one of the tools we use to forecast, they all predict how much liquid equivalent will come from a certain weather situation. And snow, that we need to convert that liquid equivalent to snow. And the way we do that is snow ratio. So basically what it is, is it's how many inches of snow do we expect to come from one inch of liquid? And that can vary significantly for many different storms. And across a storm, during a storm, you can start with a certain ratio, and that can change if you stay in the same location as the storm evolves. And that's really important to understand how much snow will fall. So for instance, we generally sort of a, a, a ballpark range that's a, a good average is 10 to 1. So from one, every one inch of liquid, you can expect 10 inches of snow. Okay, and uh, a lot of variables here because we need to nail down how much precipitation is coming and then uh, what the snowfall ratio may be. And uh, obviously that's critically important in ultimately landing in our snowfall ranges. What are some influences that may make that snowfall ratio 30 to 1 versus 7 or 8 or 6 to 1? So basically what we look at is the temperature throughout the different parts of the atmosphere. And that's important not just for the, the uh, ratio of snow uh, to liquid, but also the precipitation type. So is there going to be mixing with sleet or rain at different times during the storm? So we look at the temperature profile, not just at the surface, but how does that temperature profile uh, look throughout the entire column of the atmosphere above a certain location? And that helps us determine whether it's going to be a wet, Heavy snow, which can be like a 6 or 8 to 1 ratio, which is pretty typical in parts of the northeast, uh, can be typical in the early and later part of the season as well when it's a bit warmer in the atmosphere. Uh, during the heart of the winter season, especially out in the plains uh, into the Rockies, you can get 20, 30, some places even 40 to 1 ratios where you're getting 40 inches of snow just from one inch of liquid, which is pretty impressive. That's a dry, powdery, fluffy snow, and that blows around really well too, so that can cause even more issues with visibility and blizzard conditions. Uh, so there's really a, a a wide range we look at um, in terms of snow ratio and how that ends up impacting the amount of snow from a storm. And when you're trying to remove that snow from your driveway, you experience the difference there. There are times, and this is maybe a little more common in the northern plains, where you could take a, a leaf blower and that could clear your whole driveway easily. Or easily. Uh, other times you're shoveling that wet snow and it really, really takes a toll uh, on, on your back when you're lifting some of that wet stuff. Well, Dan, we want to talk to uh, more, uh, or at least hear from other viewers with viewer questions. So we want to hear from Tom now in New York City. So, Tom, what do you want to ask the expert? 
How difficult is it to predict how much snow is going to fall during a storm? And is it any more difficult than predicting other weather events like hurricanes, tornadoes, or just rainfall? So I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily difficult. We've sort of gone through some of the snow ratio and other in, influences to a storm. Uh, we always look for the precipitation type and whether there'll be a changeover, whether it will start as rain and go to snow or start as snow and go to rain, whether there'll be ice in the mix as well can cut down on accumulations. Uh, so it's not actually more difficult than other types of weather forecasts, but it's certainly different. We're looking at different parts of the atmosphere. We're looking at different forecast parameters during a storm. And it's important to also convey the confidence and what that confidence is in a given storm. Often many times in advance of a storm, five, six, seven days, we can be pretty confident that, that there's going to be a winter storm that's going to bring snow to a region. We can sort of rule out the fact it'll be rain. Other times, though, it takes to two or three days ahead of time to be more confident of what's going to happen. So conveying what we're confident in is always an important part of what we do at AccuWeather, telling you as a as a viewer, as a consumer of our app, what we know is an important part of our philosophy. And some regions are more difficult than others. Uh, the Rockies and out west, even the west coast can be more difficult. And some of that reason is because of the fact that we have less understanding of the real-time atmosphere uh, over the Pacific Ocean because we have less observations. So some of the tools we use um, have a bit more, harder of a time predicting uh, the snow in the west or also like Alaska is another uh, 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 part of the country that is a bit more difficult uh, to forecast snow. And there's often a an increase in our confidence when the storm, or at least the dip in the jet stream that's going to produce a storm uh, for the East Coast, when that dip in the jet stream finally reaches the West Coast, it's sampled much better. So suddenly we're getting high resolution information to uh, feed into the models and, and therefore the forecast quality is going to improve at that time. So our next question comes from Laura in Maryland and Laura writes, is there a snowstorm from your childhood that made you want to become a meteorologist? Uh, there sure is, and I think snow is probably the, the thing that really cemented my uh, interest and passion for meteorology and uh, swayed me to become a meteorologist. The, the, the storm that really pushed me in that direction was a blizzard of 1996. Uh, I grew up in central New Jersey, and we had 30 inches of snow. It's really the uh, snowstorm on record, at least in probably modern times, in the middle of New Jersey for snow. And I remember sledding. I, I, I'm, uh, basically made it a uh, big hill in my backyard of snow off our deck. We had so much snow, we were able to make our own sledding hill in our backyard from that event. So the blizzard of 96 is certainly at the top of my list, but also a few more from my childhood. Uh, right before I but don't really remember when I was younger, the, the superstorm of 93 was sort of right when I was uh, four or five years old. And then also the, uh, there were a couple of those storms, including the President's Day uh, storm in the early 2000s in February that dumped about almost two feet of snow. So I, had, I was fortunate enough to grow up in an era of plenty of important and impactful snowstorms in the Northeast. All right. And there will be more to come, which is always very exciting. Well, Dan DePotman, AccuWeather, uh, AccuWeather Senior Director of Forecast Operations and Snow Expert. Dan, thanks again for your insight, your time, and all you do here uh, to drive the bus and uh, lead our team to success. And don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. And coming up next, we're going to test your knowledge on some of those popular cold weather myths that you hear all the time in a segment we call, Is This Really a Thing? Ask the Experts will be right back. So stay with us here on the AccuWeather Network. It's time now for WeatherWise, and today we look at some cold weather myths in our segment, Is This Really a Thing? So let's start with that saying your mother or grandmother may have told you, if you go outside with wet hair, you'll catch a cold. Is this really a thing? The answer is no. Colds are caused by viruses. So you will not get a cold just by being cold. However, colder air is a better environment conducive to viruses. And there is some research that suggests the lack of sun and vitamin D during the winter may play a role in a weakened immune system. Next up, if you fall into icy water, you'll quickly die. Is this really the case? Is this really a thing? Hypothermia is prolonged exposure to the cold. Drowning is actually the bigger risk when you initially fall into cold water. People panic. Cold water shock leads them to swallow water and that can lead them to drown. Knowing you won't quickly die from hypothermia can help you remain calm for a few minutes until help arrives. And finally, put on a hat because most of your body heat escapes through your head. Is this really a thing? Again, not really true. The amount of body heat that you lose is related to the surface area exposed to the cold. 
So your head is only about 10% of the body's surface area. So you do lose some of your body heat when you don't cover your head in the cold, but not really the majority of it. Thanks again for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. Don't forget, whenever you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Have a great one.